short disclaimer before introduction and everything. I've never even attended one of these, so I'm not exactly sure what end of average talks is supposed to look like. So just so you know, if you have some certain expectations for the session, I probably will not meet them. But anyways, I am uh, I'm Alex Collingshead. I'm an assistant professor of special education at the University of Idaho. And uh, my research is all around student engagement uh, in learning from a lens of universal design for learning. And specifically, I like to work with students with autism spectrum disorders and students with more uh, moderate to severe intellectual disabilities. So this is what we will be, uh, this is the population we will be focusing on during this short session, is how, uh, how can we talk about engagement for students with the most se severe intellectual disabilities and how is it or should it be different uh, than our other conversations about engagement? And um, so in case you are not aware, we have an hour for this session and there were supposed to be three smaller sessions, so 20 minutes for each. I think there's only two of us, so there might be some you know, five minute, two minute break in between those two just to transition to new slides and all of that. Anyways, that's, uh, I think that's all. So, Let's get started. <clears throat> um, so my plan was to maybe start this session with a brief, brief vid video, but we'll see if that works. Um, it is not. It's working on my computer, but not up there. So uh, we will just skip that and not stress over it. Uh, the reason I wanted to, st so this is a video you can all find on YouTube uh, where, um, where Todd Rose talks about the end of average, and I'm sure you've all heard about it, you've seen it. So see, this will be just old news for anyone anyways. Uh, so maybe it's a good thing it's not working. And um, the reason I wanted to start with that is because um, to kind of shift this message about stopping to design, to design for average to how we talk about engagement. Because often in our classrooms we uh, we talk about engagement in terms of our average students, right? Those, or those quote unquote average students. Um, so, but then once we start talking about any of the students that are maybe a little bit different than the quote unquote average, or outside, or on the margins, or however you want to phrase that, um, we start talking about engagement differently. And, um, and what I wanted to start this conversation with is maybe shifting our mindsets to to employ this, this, okay, let's stop talking, let's stop designing for average students, let's stop thinking about engagement um, in different categories. Let's, let's, let's talk about engagement of all of our students, those students who are excelling, those students who are gifted, as well as those students who are receiving maybe more average scores in their testing, and the students who are struggling, and maybe the student, and also the students who are struggling very much. And let's, let's, Let's see how we uh, how we think about all of those students in our classroom. And uh, as you all know, the uh, federal legislation uh, brings it up. And then during one of the tech talks this morning, I really like how it was phrased about engagement being the very first step to learning. When we have high expectations for all of our students, when students are engaged, uh, we should be expecting to see actual learning outcomes for all of our students. So before we go much further in me being nervous in front of this crowd and with a mic, let's maybe engage all of you in how you all define engagement. So let's do some brainstorming here. If you would like to talk to a neighbor, that's great. Or if you don't have a neighbor, sorry, uh, then let's just, let's just share some ideas. When, when I say engagement, students' engagement learning, what is it that you're thinking about? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Genuinely interested. What else? Sense of belonging. What else? Just speak. Active. Listening. Okay. What else? Conversation. Conversation. Asking questions. Comfortable. Right. Providing answers. Okay. And anything else? Relevant. Any, what else? So as you see, what's really interesting, these are excellent answers. And what's really interesting is those answers are um, across the spectrum, right, of different ways to engage students. 
So from very academic, like answering, answering questions to sense of belonging and, um, and feeling relevant and so on, right? So a spectrum of, of, of options for how to be engaged, right? So um, when we look at research uh, on engagement, we, um, we can identify different ways researchers, researchers talk about students being engaged. And they talk about things like attending to learning tasks. Uh, they talk about things like body orientation, either to, this, to the uh, teacher or to materials or peers if they are working with peers. Uh, staying on task. When you lo look up uh, research on engagement, you often will find things like the students being on task or not being on task, right? Um, and then self-monitoring that on-task behavior is also sometimes an option. Following directions and, and the physical um, attention in terms of sitting and you know, keeping hands to yourself, feet to yourself, and so on. And, uh, and that's all. That's all great, right? We listed some of these features, not all of them. Um, but when we start looking a little bit outside of special education literature, we realize that people talk about engagement in a much broader context. And they talk about engagement as having multiple pieces. The, the behavioral and academic piece, right? So students are sitting. All of you are sitting, right? This is, this is the behavioral piece. And you're keeping your legs down very nicely and your hands to yourself. And eye contact. Oh my gosh, Alisa, thank you. Uh, so this is all the behavior pieces, right? That's part of being engaged. Another part of being engaged that's just as important is the piece that this, this lady here mentioned, answering questions, asking questions, uh, processing information, right? So the cognitive piece of engagement. And then another piece that none of that would be enough if we didn't have the piece of sense of belonging and, um, and the feeling relevant. And so the emotional pieces, being motivated to learn, right? And that also was mentioned in one of those tech talks this morning, um, how important the emotional piece is to learning. And so when, so when we look at literature on engagement for many students, we see this, this broad concept of those three categories. And how I, I really like to look at it also is, you know, that so, much, so well connects to UDL when we talk about multiple means of engagement, right? Multiple ways to engage students and also multiple layers or multiple times of en types of engagement. Now, there's a problem in literature and also in reality in the classrooms when we start thinking about students with more severe intellectual disabilities. Well, first there's a problem because sometimes we can't find those students in general education classrooms. Very often we can't find them. But now when we find them, we realize that expectations for their engagement in the classroom are very different. And then it is enough for those students, or so people think, to make sure they are sitting, they are refraining from hitting somebody next to them and keeping legs to themselves and eye contact. That would be really nice if they made eye contact, but that's about it, right? Our expectations stop there because, um, and we stop talking about the cognitive pieces of engagement, we stop talking about the emotional pieces of engagement, and it is just not okay. And um, so in, in my research, I try to make that connection where we really need to broaden the ideas or the, our understanding of engagement to make sure that our expectations are, this, are just as high for all the students and all of our students, regardless of where they fall on the spectrum and range of abilities and, and everything, all kinds of diversity categories, our expectations that all students should be physically engaged and cognitively engaged and emotionally engaged should be there for all students. Uh, so. Okay, we, I kind of did cover all of that. So um, I am bringing this visual, and as I was listening this morning, it's like, all right, maybe I should be revising my slides right now. I'm not going to revise my slides. I do love this visual. I talk about it from different, different perspectives. I'm sure as all of you have heard it kind of br brought up to the conversation in different ways. Um, I like to talk about it as, you know, in a form of removing barriers, right? So we can, uh, you know, inequality, we can give supports, the same supports to all the students, right? In equity, we can uh, give appropriate supports, 
uh, to students who need it versus those that don't need it. And then in the UDL, from UDL perspective, we can think, okay, well, there's really no point for there to be a wooden fence. We do need some kind of fence for safety. So let's redesign the type of fence we're using, the environment we're in, and then everyone can, um, can access to, to see the game. Um, so I like to think about it for this particular presentation or for this topic in terms of removing those barriers to engagement, right? So uh, changing our expectations and changing our, um, well, I guess there's no better word than expectations. Making sure we have high expectations for engagement for all of our students, regardless of their ability level, regardless of, um, of where they are coming from, their background knowledge, and so on. And uh, so what would be some of those barriers? And um, a few years ago, uh, Alisa Lowry, who is not paying attention and being engaged, I am publicly shaming you again. I am so sorry. Anyways, everyone, this is Alisa Lowry, and she's amazing, and I am not publicly shaming her. I'm uh, advertising who she is. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we were um, talking about engagement and barriers to engagement. At, uh, at the CAST symposium, actually. That's where this list came from. And so we identify some possible barriers to many students' engagement. Uh, and so some of these would be uh, in, in terms of instructions, when we provide information, directions that there's too many directions or not enough directions. If we provide directions in just one way in versus multiple ways so that students can uh, access it from different points in, in, within the activity um, where, um, where we don't provide students with those cognitive supports, right? Uh, so then we are lowering or eliminating or kind of squ squelching, that's not the right English word, whatever, um, the cognitive piece of engagement, right? Where, where students just, just are motivated are not really pushed to, to really cognitively engage because we are not giving them enough supports. We, there are those barriers to cognitive engagement and those, you know, things like not providing them with gr graphic organizers or visual support or only giving verbal directions versus, versus multiple ways of directions and having a visual and so on and so forth. Um, and then similarly, when we, um, you know, barriers to emotional engagement would be things like not having connection to the instruct to instruction, not for instruction not to be relevant, or not really drawing on background knowledge. So where students don't really have a great connection. And uh, one of the my one of my favorite examples is um, by my former student who, when, upon graduation, went to work in Alaska and. She, um, she told me the story about trying to uh, teach her students. It, I don't remember exactly what the topic of the lesson was, but um, she was talking about cows to them. And, and she said, you know what, Alex? I was looking around the classroom, and the students should be excited. You know, we were talking about animals, and they just couldn't care less. They had, there was nothing. They, I couldn't connect with them and so on. And she kept thinking about it. And, she realized that many of the students in her classroom, and she works in Juneau, Alaska, which if you know, you know from the map, it is pretty isolated, right? Many of the students in her classroom have never seen a cow other than on TV. They had no connection. They had no relevant background knowledge. And so when she introduced the same topic a few days later and started talking about whales instead of cows as the example animal in that whatever topic that was, I can't remember, maybe I should find out. Uh, and suddenly everyone was engaged because they had that background knowledge, right? They had something that was relevant to them. They had something to connect to. And that emotional engagement piece was activated so much better. Um, so I think I'm starting to run out of time. So, uh, and I don't want to just read the slides. You have them right in front of you. But I guess to re it before we go into questions is, um, I really urge you to have high expectations for all of your students. I, really urge you to think about engagement in very broad context in terms of understanding that there's multiple ways for students to engage as well as there's multiple layers to engagement. And it is not enough to ask students to just be behaviorally engaged and assume that everyone who's sitting here instead of, I don't know, jumping or running around or kicking somebody is engaged, right? Some of you might be physically here present, but really thinking about what you're going to do this weekend. 
so cognitive engagement is not present or you n might not really care about what I'm saying and or well if you're hating it it would be emotional engagement just not very positive um, but if you don't care right then then it's like oh whatever this lady's talking okay hopefully soon she will be done and uh, so so anyways point is multiple ways to engage students multiple ways to engage all of your students those students who are excelling those students who are kind of you know, your more typical traditional quote unquote average, as well as the students who traditionally were really excluded from um, the opportunity to be engaged in instruction, the opportunity to, um, to attend in general education classrooms and actually be able to um, benefit from the from curriculum and, and learn. So anyways, I feel like I rambled, so please don't, there's no evaluations, right? There is? Oh, darn it. Okay, well, anyways, are there any questions? Are there any thoughts? Is there, did it make any sense? Okay, thank you. I don't think so. If, if you're asking me my opinion, I don't think there is one. I think we should have those expectations for all of our students. And, and not just expectations. I think when you think about designing your learning environment and designing instruction, you and thinking about overcoming barriers, right, and all of, all of the processes that go with an UDL planning, I really f think that all teachers should be thinking about that really broad understanding of engagement. What might be some barriers? for students to be physically and physically engaged or behaviorally engaged, as well as what might be some barriers for them to really cognitively engage with this material. What are some barriers to be emotionally engaged, right? And as you're planning to plan to overcome the barriers that are not necessary and then, um, and then address by providing them with multiple means of engagement and, and so on. Does this answer your question? So, but that's totally, that's my opinion. That, uh, Anyways, I don't think there's weight. I don't think one comes before another, but I think that maybe the behavior piece is the easiest, and that's why in some classrooms or from some people's perspective, that's where we stop, especially when we talk about students with the most severe intellectual disabilities, right? Because of expectations, because some people don't believe that, that we can ex have high expectations for all of our students, and that is just not okay. Right. And maybe a sub layer of a layer. You know, like they're not going deep enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that comment and question. Any other comments, questions? All right, then I will start stop rambling and now you have an actual really good speaker. So <laughs>